Hello, welcome to Virtual Humans Lecture 2. Today we will um, see the image formation process. And basically, although this is a Virtual Humans course, um, oftentimes we're interested in extracting uh, 3D human models from images. And in order to do that, we need to understand first how images are formed and how real people appear in images and what are the effects the projection effects um, that occur. So we will start with a, an introduction to get an intuitive idea of um, things like linear perspective. And, and then we will formalize this and we'll see um, how we can express the whole image formation process, the geometric part of the image formation process with a projection matrix. So one of the goals that we will see during this course is to extract 3D virtual humans from images. And essentially, in order to invert this process, which is a nil pose pro problem because we are missing the depth dimension, we first need to understand how an image is formed. This means how a 3D world object gets projected into the image. Essentially, there's light bouncing um, off the surface and this light is captured in the image sensor. And uh, at the image sensor, there's an image that is formed. And essentially we need to understand what is the geometric transformation that occurs to go from the 3D world to the 2D world. So <clears throat> for the graphics problem, of course, it's even more direct. We also need to understand given a 3D object or a 3D representation of a human, we need to know how to render a realistic image um, of, of our 3D scene representations. So for both types of problems, generating realistic images and inverting the image formation process, we need to understand the image formation process first. So essentially, um, we have the following um, um, problem. We have like a, a world scene, as you can see here. And then we have like um, a camera with its own coordinate system. And we have like what is called um, the image, the, the sensor, which will have like its own image coordinates. And what we're going to see in this lecture is how do we go from this world 3D object to this coordinates in 2D, like um, X and Y, and eventually pixel coordinates. So let's start with the basics, <clears throat> the laws of perspective. So common assumptions are that light leaving an object travels in straight lines, and these lines converge to a point in the eye. And already Euclid knew about natural perspective. Natural perspective is this intuitive fact that more distant objects subtend smaller visual angles. What does this mean? So consider an observer here, shown as this eye over here, and consider an object which is defined by these two dots, uh, which is managed by these two dots. As the object gets closer to the observer, the subtended angle that the observer sees increases. That's why theta two is larger than theta one. Sorry about that. Uh, let's skip updates. So essentially like um, at the beginning, people didn't know how to draw a proper image they understood this concept of um, natural perspective and they try to um, essentially draw paintings in which further objects, they try to make them smaller, but there's something off in these pictures. Something doesn't look quite right. So the tower here behind looks, um, looks a little bit too big. Uh, so here, like this painting over here also doesn't look quite realistic. And that's because this painting is not quite correct. 
So natural perspective is not sufficient to draw a proper painting. To draw a proper painting, to project the 3D scene into the image, you need to consider the linear perspective. So <clears throat> linear perspective was discovered by Filippo Brunelleschi in the year 1413. And basically it says that a perspective image is formed by the intersection of the lines with a picture plane or the canvas. So in natural perspective, we've seen that as the object gets closer to the observer, the subtended angle gets bigger. Now, in, la in linear perspective, we're gonna obtain an image by intersecting the rays going from the object to the observer, and we are gonna obtain like, um, like a pixel or like a, a dot in the canvas as the intersection of this line of this, this uh, ray go, uh, leave, departing from the object and intersecting this image plane. So the same as with natural perspective, as the object gets closer to the observer, the object appears bigger. So this height of the object in the image, Y1 for this distant object, gets larger, gets to y2 as the object gets closer to the camera. This proportion, however, of how much larger the object gets is not the same as with natural perspective. This means that the quotient of y2 over y1 is not the same as the quotient over of theta2 over theta1. So how can we describe this mathematically? It turns out that linear perspective is um, quite easy to describe mathematically because we can use similar triangles to figure out what the height of the object Y should be. So imagine I have an object with height H and, to, and we want to know what this Y should be on the image plane. For this, we need to know how far the uh, observer is to the image plane. This is what is denoted as F, which we will see that we will define as the focal, um, focal distance. Then, like we have that the object is at a depth, depth is how far it is from the observer, Z. So by similar triangles, we can figure out that H, this triangle here, is similar to this triangle over here, this small triangle. So H divided by Z should be equal to Y divided by F. Therefore, Y should be equal to H times F divided by Z. And this is how we obtain this object coordinate in 2D. So a few remarks here. Notice that this is not a linear mapping with respect to the object coordinates, because we have this division by Z. So as the object gets further away, Z gets larger, and therefore the object will appear smaller because this Z is in the denominator. Another thing that you should observe is that as the focal length gets larger, F gets larger, like the object will appear larger in the image. So these are the things that, um, this is the most simple model that is widely used in computer vision. And we will see more of this um, later. So basically you have this division by Z. So you basically can already understand that if I'm twice as far, I will ap appear half as big in the image. And this is very important when trying to understand, for example, humans in, in images. So as I was saying, linear perspective is not a linear mapping. So lines will remain straight. However, like parallel lines in the three world will not remain parallel. Since the object appears smaller and smaller as we get further away from the camera, parallel lines will converge to so-called vanishing points. You can observe this in these um, columns over here. So of course these columns are getting further away from the camera. And although these lines over here are parallel in the 
3D world, they will not be parallel in the image because these columns are further and further away until like they will converge to a single point. The same can be said for this um, parallel lines that you observe here. So you have here one vanishing point, another vanishing point, and um, another vanishing point. So one natural question is how many vanishing points there are in a perspective drawing? What do you think? There's gonna be three because there's three dimensions. Infinite? The correct answer is as many vanishing points as parallel lines. There can be infinite vanishing points. Every pair of parallel lines that are not essentially on the plane perpendicular to the, to the line of sight um, will converge to a vanishing point. So now another interesting and perhaps counterintuitive uh, question, or the answer is counterintuitive. So imagine I'm looking at the at the facade, and the facade is really, really, really long. Okay, really long. For example, I'm I'm looking at like perpendicular to the Chinese like um, wall, for example. Um, so the question is like, should the distance end? the distant ends of this facade, should, should they be drawn smaller than its center in a perspective drawing? What do you think? So I recommend now you pause the video and think a little bit about this problem. So imagine the long facade is this, um, and I'm looking perpendicular at this um, plane where the, the building is built. Should it look like that, such that this um, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Think about the depth. Is the depth changing as I'm getting further away to the right and to the left? The depth is not changing. Therefore, in linear perspective, um, this, this, this is not what should happen. Like straight lines, remain straight. So, and lines parallel to the picture plane do not converge. They should remain um, basically parallel. So when you see a very large drawing of a very long facade, they will, like the, the distant ends, they will appear smaller when you view the drawing, drawing, but this is not because of linear perspective. It's just because of natural perspective because the angles subtended to the eye will be smaller. Okay, so I hope that's, um, so you, could, you can spend a little bit of time thinking about this because it's something that is um, perhaps confusing and counterintuitive and it leads to confusion when thinking about computer vision problems. So now I ask the following question. I am an observer and I observe columns. Okay, like these columns over here, and I take a picture or I make a drawing and I get this. And the question is like, why does this drawing look distorted? Any ideas? Well, this drawing is not distorted. It's just that you're viewing the drawing from too far away. To see this drawing correctly, you should be looking much closer to the drawing to respect the, the, uh, the distances in which it was captured in the first place, right? So this is something that um, it's a physical property and um, uh, yeah, you cannot, you, you cannot get, uh, get rid of this when taking pictures. Okay, so this was a quick uh, introduction into linear perspective and natural perspective. So just a recap, is that natural perspective is the visual angle subtended by a feature in the world. Linear perspective is a way to construct, is the right way of, of drawing images um, in an image. So basically it's constructed by intersecting the lines of sight with a picture plane. 
And an image has, because of the linear perspective, has infinitely many vanishing points, one per direction of line in the scene, and lines parallel to the picture plane do not converge to a vanishing point. Okay, so until here, you can think of questions which we will um, discuss in the Q&A uh, like session. So here I'm showing you a picture of a camera and you can see here, there's a lot of glass. This is the lenses of a camera. And here you, ha you have the sensor. And a natural question is like, do cameras need lenses? Can we just put a sensor out in the world and just record an image? What do you think would happen? Well, the image you would get would be pretty much very blurry and it would be some sort of an average. Think of the points, the light that every pixel in the image would be recording. Like you would be recording light coming from all possible directions, right? So essentially like the color that you would record there would be an average. And furthermore, this average between a nearby points, for example, this red point and this yellow point would be pretty much the same. So you would obtain a very much blurred image. And that's because at every point in the image, you're integrating over all the rays um, hitting that particular pixel. Okay, so that's not an option. Um, so since ages, it has been known that you can make a hole in a wall, like what you can see here, um, and put a sensor on the other side. This is, a, this is the sensor, a canvas and um, to create a picture on the other side. This is what is known as pinhole camera or camera obscura. With this, we will obtain an image with a correct linear perspective. Um, notice that the image will be inverted though, because like the top, the top uh, of the object will appear at the bottom of the image and the bottom of the object will appear at the top of the image. So, Ignoring like um, some like um, some effects that 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 um, that we will not cover in this course, everything will be in focus because every point in the image is recorded, and basically it records a single ray like hitting that particular um, point in the image. So, um, right. So the model of a pinhole is as follows. It's very simple. It's what we saw a little bit before. Um, so the pinhole is in the middle and here you have the wall and here you have the 3D scene. So completely equivalent is like the, what is called the Dürer's glass, um, which is basically you can consider the image without inverting by placing this in front of the pinhole um, as opposed to placing it behind the pinhole. But the models are completely equivalent. And it will be easier to consider um, that the image plane is in front of the pinhole because then we can do, um, it's easier to see like the relationships with similar triangles, what we see, we've, we, what, we've saw, what we've seen before. So what is the effect of or what do you think is a potential problem with a pinhole? Well, if the pinhole is very small, it will let very little light go through the pinhole. This means that the image that it will produce will be very dark or basically non-existent. Yeah? Um, so that's why we don't use just pinholes to create images because there's not enough light going through the pinhole. So you might say, well, I can make the pinhole a bit larger so that more light comes in. What do you think will happen then? Well, then what's going to happen is that um, is that the, the image will get blurred because for a given pixel, um, there's going to be like a cone of rays that, um, that, that arrive at that particular pixel. And this will make 
the whole image look um, like blurred. Uh, so this is this can be visualized here. So for a given pixel, you have a cone of um, like rays that that come from three D scene points that converts to the same pixel, right? And this is true even for very small pinholes, and that's the reason we do not use pinholes. Luckily, a lens does the same thing. Takes all the rays coming from a point and it focuses them on a single pixel. And it still produces a linear perspective, ignoring some like um, radial distortion art, uh, effects. So photographic camera produces the same 2D planar geometric projection as a camera obscura and a lens replaces the pinhole and, um, and film or digital sensor becomes the picture plane. So rotating the camera and lens, of course, around the lens center adds or removes vanishing points, right? That's when you change, um, when you rotate the camera. So we're not gonna get very deep into geometrical optics, but I think it's important to understand a little bit the basics of how an image is constructed and to, to know a little bit um, like the basics of, of lenses. So this, with these two principles that I'm showing you here, you can derive pretty much everything. So these are the common um, sort of approximations. And these two principles are saying that given a lens, like parallel rays converge at the focal length from the lens. And this focal length is a physical property of the lens, okay? And so different lenses, depending on their geometry, they will have different focal length. Okay, so parallel, parallel rays converge to a single point. And this distance at which the parallel rays converge is called the focal length. Then rays going through the center of the lens are not deviated. Hence, they have the same perspective as a pinhole. So with this, um, we can already understand the Gauss ray tracing construction. So we're gonna have that for a given object, we're gonna shoot a ray and this ray will converge to a given like point in the image plane. And by symmetry, I can um, send a ray back and it will land on the object. And any ray in between here that, that departs this point in the object will converge to the same point. This is, this is when this, um, this object is in focus in this image plane. So essentially the lens is focusing a lot of rays into a single pixel to construct an image. So it's basically, um, it's like having a pinhole camera model with enough light coming into the image sensor. Okay, and different points in the object, of course, they will converge at different points in this image plane, and this will, will, will render the image of an object in the image. So as I was saying, like parallel rays converge at the distance of the focal length, okay? These are the, these are the, the, the parallel rays. And these parallel rays are in focus. Now, if I move the sensor, this is when the sensor coincides with the focal length, this, part, this physical property of the, of the lenses. Now, when I move the sensor away from the focal length, what, what begins to happen is that um, objects that are not at the infinite start to be in focus, okay? So, and depending on where do I, where I move the sensor relative to the lenses or relative to the focal length, I will be focusing different objects, right? So this is a difference with the lenses and a pinhole camera. The lenses can only focus um, um, a given distance to the camera perfectly, right? So that's, that's the main difference. In, in a pinhole, everything is in perfect focus. Here, um, you're focusing particular objects at the particular focus distance, 
Okay. And this is how actually focusing can work in a camera. You can move the sensor away from the lenses or vice versa. You can make the lenses further or closer in order to focus a particular object. You can also like change the, by combinations of different lenses, you can change the shape of the lenses or effectively change the, the shape of the lenses in order to change the focal length in order to zoom or zoom out, yeah? Okay, so like with the two principles that we saw before, parallel rays converge at the focal length and rays going through the center of the camera are not deviated, we can derive the most important formula for lenses, which tells us how to place the sensor relative to the lenses in order to focus a particular object at a, gift, a given distance SO. So this triangle here has the same angle as this triangle over here. So by similar triangles, uh, we can derive the following, that yi should be equal, divided by y0 should be equal to si divided by s0. Okay, this is this equivalence over here. Now we can construct another pair of triangles, which are also similar. This angle is the same as this angle. Therefore, yi divided by um, y0 over here should be the same as um, SI minus F, this segment over here, divided by F. Now taking these two equalities, right, this YI divided by Y0, we can e equate these two um, uh, equations and obtain what is the most important formula that we know for lenses, which is 1 over SO plus 1 over SI equals 1 over F. So now that we have this formula under our belt, like we can look at this uh, picture that I was showing before, how to focus. And now we know exactly how far we have to move in order to focus, right? So um, for a given object distance S0, this formula tells us where how large SI should be in order to have everything in focus, okay? Um, so this is given by this um, formula over here. So now I pose a question. In which situation do I have an image that is of the same size as the real world? And I will not give you the answer and we'll discuss this in the um, Q&A tomorrow. Uh, and, and then we will see other examples of this. So think about this. Okay, so something I want to make clear is like the difference between the F that we use when we talk about pinhole camera models in computer vision and the F, which is a physical property of the camera. And this can be confusing. And um, I think a lot of people confuse this. And so it's important to, to know that, that they are different. So when we talk about a pinhole camera model, we have this for the following like um, model where F is the distance from the, the pinhole or the viewpoint to the image plane. And we obtain the object height, Y, as F, which is this focal, we call it focal length, but let's let, yeah, F times H divided by Z, what we saw before, right? Where depth with Z is the depth. Now with a camera lens model, we have something slightly more involved where we have here, um, the, the F is the focal length, which is a physical property of the camera. It does not depend on where I place the sensor relative to the lenses. And um, we have that Y, which is the object height, is gonna be equal to, uh, what matters is this distance SI, which is the distance uh, to the lens, okay? Because by similar triangles, I can construct um, the same triangles as before, like this like uh, this, this triangle over here, right? And this, uh, this triangle over here. And so basically I have that Y equals SI times H divided by Z, where SI is now F, which is this physical property of the lens, plus 
x, which is how far the sensor is placed from this focal length point. Okay. So in practice, in computer vision, we most of the time work with this model above, and we don't worry about this, um, th these differences anymore, but it's important to know that, um, that they refer to two slightly different things. So a few more remarks. For a lens camera model, we derive the following relationship. Um, one over Z plus one over SI equals one over F. Um, notice I changed here as zero by Z, but yeah, I mean, it's the same. So one thing to, to note here is that as the depth goes to infinity, Z goes to infinity, we obtain that SI, this distance from the sensor to the lenses, tends to F. Right and at, at, in this situation, like the lens with focal length f is equivalent to a pinhole at distance f. So another natural question that we can ask is, if the sensor size is constant, how does the focal length change the field of view? Right, the field of view of the image. So. As the focal length gets smaller, closer to the lenses, the field of view will increase. We have a wide, wide angle camera. As the focal length increases, we're getting towards a telephoto um, camera. And basically, the field of view will get smaller. How much smaller? Well, that's also, again, very basic trigonometry. We have this triangle over here. Right. We're interested in this field of view, like two times this angle. And basically, we can consider this triangle over here. So essentially, this base here is f, and this height here is h halves. So we need to take the arc tangent of h halves divided by f, and we need to multiply two times because we want this angle two times. So this is the formula that relates the field of view with, um, with the focal length. Right. So, of course, if the sensor size is smaller, the field of view is smaller too. And um, smaller sensors either have fewer pixels or uh, or smaller or smaller pixels, which then become noisier, noisier because they gather less light and then you have more noise. Something that is important, and it's again, perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, is that because of this linear perspective, we can have um, different relationships of sizes of people, uh, depending on how, how big the focal length is when we take the picture. So look at these three pictures. The frontal person appears of the same size in each of the three pictures. However, like the person that is a bit further away, like looks very different in size when we take the picture with a wide angle camera or when we take the picture with a telephoto. Telephoto camera means like large focal length. Why does this happen? Like take, take a second now uh, to think about this and perhaps pause the video to, to think about this effect. So the first thing you should notice is that by because the the depth controls the height of the person but also the focal length controls the height of the person we can move back while we increase the zoom in order to keep the size of the frontal person um, the same right we can do this with the camera we move backwards but at the same time we're um, zooming in but moving back changes the perspective effects so one way you can think about it is that because the focal length gets very, very large, the difference in depths between the frontal person and the back person becomes less important. So you can figure out mathematically, like what is the what are these effects? Um, and you can derive all this with the formulas that we've seen. So um, yeah, so moving forward while shortening the focal length lets you keep objects at one depth 
uh, the same time. And this in cinematography is called the dually zoom effect or vertigo effect, which was uh, used in the in the movie um, Vertigo, where you can see that um, when they are going up this tower and there's this these stairs. If you've seen the movie, like the camera is like like you can see how everything um, keeps in focus, and this is done by either um, getting further away and zooming at the same time or vice versa. Now, when taking pictures, this effect is very important because it can make people appear very different in images. So this is the same person taken with different camera, with different focal lengths. So from wide angle to standard to telephoto. And notice that as the um, for, for the wide angle, you have like this perspective effects because the, um, the nose is closer to the camera and this, this perspective effects become more important as the focal length is smaller. If you're, you're further away, you're, you're further away from the object, these differences in depth between the nose and the rest of the face become less important and, and, and the focal length is much more important in relation, in relationship to that. So in the, in in that sense, like this is um, as we move further and further further away, it's as if the person would be on a single image plane, and you have no perspective effects for for this region of the face. Okay, so that's something to consider because when we are trying to extract three D from images, you really need to think about like in the first place how the image was formed. Okay, so to recap, pinhole cameras compute correct linear perspective, but they don't gather enough light, therefore the images look dark. Lenses gather more light, but there's only one plane of the scene in focus. The distance from the lens to this plane is called the focus distance. And you can change what is in focus by moving the sensor or changing the lens by changing the focal length. So the focal length is a physical property of the, of the lenses and it determines the field of view. And from, from wide angle to telephoto, <clears throat> and it depends on the sensor size, the field of view. Okay, so now we have like a, an intuitive understanding. Now let's formalize this mathematically. Basically, now the goal will be to express the image formation process with a single projection matrix. So we start with world coordinates. This world coordinates is like a coordinate system that you can choose in the 3D world. And then the objects are represented in this world coordinate system. And um, then you have the camera coordinate system. This is the coordinate system of the camera. And by convention, like the Z of this coordinate system is always in the direction of, um, is the optical axis, is the direction where the camera is pointing towards. And then the Y X plane, um, the Y and X are um, parallel to the image plane. Okay. And F in a pinhole camera model is called the focal length. Okay. Which is F units away from the image plane in, um, from the optical axis. Okay, so an equivalent, as we've seen before, an equivalent model is to place the image plane in front of the pinhole, right here, and we can derive how large the image will be based on similar triangles as we've seen before. So, um, so an image gets digitized into pixels, um, and basically the process is that um, there's a series of transformations. And for each of these transformations, we will um, see what is the corresponding matrix. And then basically we will concatenate all these matrices to, to obtain a single projection matrix. So essentially you have like, you first go from world coordinates to camera coordinates. Then you go from camera coordinates to image coordinates by linear perspective. And then finally you basically have to account for sensor size and, and the pixel size and the center and, 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 uh, and other effects to obtain pixel coordinates. So essentially, like the forward projection goes from wall coordinates, camera coordinates, film coordinates, and finally pixel coordinates. And I think of this uh, each of these operations as a, as a transformation 
and basically we'll concatenate all these transformations into a single matrix. Notice that in computer vision, we are often interested in the reverse problem, going from pixels to world coordinates. And this is a new post problem. We need to use priors in order to revert this lossy projection model. Um, but first we need to understand how the forward projection model works. So let's first understand how do we um, do linear perspective, perspective projection from camera coordinates to film coordinates. And this will be a bit repetition of what we've seen already. So essentially like um, a scene point P, right? Gets projected into the image according to the following equations, F big X, which is the big X will be the coordinates of the 3D world point, the, the 3D point in camera coordinates divided by Z, which is the depth. This is the depth is always the distance from the optical axis, from the optical center uh, to the image uh, plane, where the, the, to, to the, exactly, to the um, image plane where the object is captured. So by similar triangles, you can derive that for both the X and Y, you can derive that um, X is to big X as F is to big Z. Therefore, we can derive these um, formulas over here and you can do the same for Y. So that's why you have these um, um, relationships over here. So how do we represent this with a matrix equation? Well, first of all, can we represent this with a matrix equation? I thought that we can only represent linear mappings with matrices. So how can we do this? So the division by Z means the mapping is actually not linear. So if we want to represent this with a linear, uh, with a linear matrix, with a matrix, we need to do a change of coordinates and Therefore, we need to introduce here homogeneous coordinates, which will be very like, convenient um, for our purposes. So what are homogeneous coordinates? You probably have seen this in other lectures. So basically you represent a 2D point by a 3D point by um, adding a fictitious third coordinate. And by convention, we specify that um, we can recover the 2D point with uh, with a fictitious third coordinate as follows, x prime divided by z prime, y prime divided by z prime. Um, so, okay, this might look a little bit awkward uh, construction, but we will see how this is very useful for uh, for, for for dealing with, uh, with image projection. So note the following, like if I add a third coordinate that is one, or if like if I consider the following homogeneous point x, y, one, and now I scale it by any non-negative um, scalar k, um, I will recover exactly the same point. So 2x to y2, kx, ky, k, because then I will end up dividing kx divided by k and ky divided by k, I will obtain exactly the same point x, y. Okay, so these points are in homogeneous coordinates they would recover the same 2D point. Hmm? Okay, so now what we can do is like with this um, homogeneous coordinates, we can represent this essentially with a linear matrix like this uh, equations over here. Like all I need to do is like, uh, okay, so I need to um, multiply by F in the corresponding entry of the matrix and, um, and, and that's it. And I need to add a one such that the, homogeneous third coordinate will be the depth itself. And because we said we defined it this way, that the point will re be recovered by dividing by Z. Um, if we place the right depth here, we will recover these equations over here. So this matrix form in homogeneous coordinates is completely equivalent to these two equations. Yeah, so we're not doing anything different. We're just expressing this in terms of a matrix and defining like this homogeneous coordinates in an additional operation. Okay, so now we have to think of, first of all, how we transform the world object in world coordinates to camera coordinates. 
And this is a, a simple world to camera transformation, which you've probably seen many times. Um, next, we will see more about rotations, but just now um, you should uh, basically just know that a rotation matrix has its column columns, which are the axis of the coordinate frame here, <clears throat> um, like um, uwb expressed with the other coordinate frame x, y, z. And then basically, in order to express a point in um, to, to transform a point from world coordinates to camera coordinates, we can just, um, so this PW, uh, we can first translate it by C, right? PW minus C, and then rotate it by R. Yeah, so a standard change of coordinates. So this can be expressed with a matrix, of course, <clears throat> where we have a rotation and a translation uh, by by this this um, minus c, yeah. So this way we can transform uh, world coordinate world coordinates by uh, we can transform world coordinates to camera coordinates, yeah. So now I pose a question: What is the first column of this rotation matrix? What is R one one R two one R three one? Well. That's going to be like um, the coordinates, like it's going to be the, the first vector of the world coordinate frame, right? Uh, expressed in camera coordinates. And the same goes for the second column and third column. That's why you can express a linear mapping with the matrix, because you can express the transformed linear basis um in as the and you can put them as columns in a matrix okay so when we multiply by 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 uh, this matrix by by the point like um like you know we, we, we will obtain like a linear combination of these columns which are the basis uh, the basis tra transformed yeah so think of the following like what if the column um Yeah, so what would happen if the camera and wall coordinates would be aligned? Then you would obtain, of course, here, the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on, right? So another perhaps more interesting example is the following, like this stereo rig where um, you have like a left camera located at 0, 0, 0, and a right camera located at TX 0, 0. And um, yeah, so let's look at, so you can place the, the world coordinate frame um, aligned with the left camera. And now like you can see how um, the left camera relates. It's basically everything is the identity and you have a zero translation because you have alignment of the world coordinate frame and the camera. Or like you can consider the right camera where the axes are aligned. So remember the picture, the axis Y, Z, X are aligned with this right camera, Y, X, Z, but you have a translation here. That's why you have to add this um, minus TX over here. Yeah, because it's located at the world position TX zero, zero. Right, so to obtain world um, to obtain the, the the coordinates in the left camera we would obtain the following formula f x divided by z f y divided by z to obtain the right camera like we would obtain f x minus dx because this camera has been displaced divided by z f y divided by z yeah Yeah, so a bit, a little bit more of the same. Like when we think about rotations, I don't think about translations. And basically, to get things right, um, basically this equation tells you how vectors in the world coordinate system, including the coordinate axis, get transformed into the coordinate, the camera coordinate system. Yeah. 
So rotations are a property, of course, of the axis, the relationship between the axis of the coordinate frames and has nothing to do with the translation itself. So how do you figure out rotations? Um, yeah, basically what I was saying, like each of the columns is each of the basis of the, the source coordinate frame, in this case, the world coordinate frame um, transformed um, or expressed in, in, in the other coordinate frame. So basically, um, if you want to figure out what the column should be, think of how the world axis, right, which is one zero zero, um, how it corresponds to the camera axis ABC. So if we place here, we transform the one zero zero vector, we will obtain the first column, which is essentially, um, of course, then the first column is like just the first basis of the world coordinate frame rotate, like um, expressed in the in the camera coordinates, and so on. <clears throat> so sometimes it's easier to specify what the camera is in the world coordinate um, frame, and then we can just um, take the rotation inverse in order to obtain um, the, the correct transformation. And actually in rotations, it turns out that the inverse is the same as the transpose, and therefore um, that's, that's trivial to invert this um, three by three matrix. Okay, so... Again, these columns will be the world axis in camera coordinates. The second column will be the world Y axis in camera coordinates. And the third column will be the world Z axis in camera coordinates. Yeah, that's why this is a linear mapping. Um, analogously, like the rows will be the camera X axis in world coordinates. The second row will be the camera Y axis in world coordinates, and the third row will be the camera Z axis in world coordinates. Okay, so that's basically um, what we need to do to transform from world coordinates uh, from world coordinates to camera coordinates before we do the linear perspective. Right? To do linear perspective, everything has to be in camera coordinates because the coordinate system needs to be. Um, aligned with the image plane in order to do linear perspective. Okay, so we know how to transform 3D world coordinates into camera coordinates, and we know how to go from car camera coordinates to film coordinates with linear perspective. Now, the next thing we need to see is how we obtain actually the pixels. And one way of thinking about going from film coordinates to pixel coordinates is by thinking of an affine, affine transform. So it essentially describes the transformation between the film coordinates, the projected image, and the pixel array that depends on the actual hardware of the camera, right? Um, so it depends on how the grid of sensors, how large the pixels are, and the size, and so on and so forth. So the first thing we need to be aware of is the center of the image. This is a source of of of, um, of confusion oftentimes, and uh, so in principle, the center of the sensor is um, at the center, which is the principal point, but it can also be placed at the at the corner of the image, um, and that's why, like you have, like this plus O X. Right, which is accounting for where the principal point is. Um, and then you have like this pixel array, which um, has the coordinates not x, y, but u and v. And be careful because this um, u and v might be sometimes flipped with respect to x and y. And then if you realize that the image appears reverted or something like this. This is typically because the coordinate system of the pixel array is not aligned with the film coordinate system. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so be careful with this um, sort of uh, like alignment between pixel coordinates and um, film coordinates. And then there's something that is there are like, I mean, these are all like what I call like the intrinsic camera parameters. Um, so basically, 
like sampling de determines how many rows and columns are in the image. So this depends on the scanning resolution and will create like a different pixel array with different um, resolutions. And basically like in the CCD, you're capturing light and then you're basically getting these analog signals that get resampled um, in order to form pixels, right? And, and obtain pixel color values. So at the same scanning resolution, if the sensor is bigger, I will obtain a higher um, resolution, right? So, uh, so, and you should note that the pixels might be of uh, different shapes than squared. That's why, like here, you might have these um, different scales for the X coordinate of the pixel um, than the um, Y coordinate of the pixel, right? So if SX equals SI, I have squared pixels, but um, otherwise I have like an aspect ratio of SY over SX for the pixels. Okay, so that's the equation, like a pixel U. Now it's gonna be like the film coordinates, which is FX over Z plus OX to account for the principal point, which is the, the coordinate origin and one over SX to account for the size of the pixels. And so how do we express this with a matrix? Well, it's not very difficult. We can write the following matrix here. This is the multiplying factor. So now F um, essentially gets divided by SX and SY, and we have like an additional OX and OY um, um, in addition here that accounts for this, um, this translation. And um, right, so we can write this in, um, yeah, so note that this, sometimes you have these minus signs because of the, this um, coordinate system of the pixel array is not aligned with the film coordinates, but in principle, we can um, write this in matrix form. Uh, so we can um, um, separate like this matrix here. And then basically we have, um, like this affine um, transformation that maps from film coordinates to pixel coordinates. And we have like this um, M projection that accounts for the focal length and for linear perspective, if we do the, the proper division by Z with, uh, with the homogeneous coordinates. So we've expressed now, like how we obtain a pixel um, from a point in camera coordinates, right? With a matrix M int, which is the internal camera matrix, um, which is formed, this internal camera matrix is composed of this affine transformation to go from film coordinates to pixel coordinates and this M projection, which does the linear perspective. All right, so now we have this M int that accounts for the intrinsic camera matrix and we have the big M, which is just the rotation and translation that accounts for the external um, transformation from world coordinates to camera coordinates. So we can compose the two matrices to form what is called a projection matrix. And so now we know with a single matrix how we can go from world coordinates to pixel coordinates by composing, stacking um, these uh, matrices. Yeah, And this is gonna be useful for uh, for, for example, if I have to compare my, if I have to render an image of a virtual human, I need this projection matrix. If I want to compare like how my model, right, compares to the pixels in the image, I can use this projection camera model. And this is basically what is used in computer vision um, all the time. I should mention sometimes it's um, not known what is the focal length. And in this case, some people use an even easier model, which is called orthographic projection. Orthographic projection is ignoring the perspective effects. As I was saying before, the perspective effects can be ignored once you're very far away from the camera. So this is suited for telephoto and telecentric lens. These are very large focal lengths or the objects are very far away, then you can um, ignore the perspective effects. So what is orthographic projection? It's essentially removing the Z dimension. You just remove it. And then you scale the object by a, by a constant in order to make it of the proper size in the image. That's it. 
So it's a much simpler model. It's um, it's not going to work very well when you're relatively close to the camera because you're going to ignore the fact that you know my face now appears bigger than my shoulders because I'm closer to the camera. So this would not be accounted for with an orthographic camera model. So we can see this um, effect uh, going from a fully perspective model to a weak perspective or orthographic camera model. It's also called weak perspective. You will see in the literature. And you can see this by increasing the focal length. The effects of the perspective are less and less apparent. So notice how we have a vanishing point here. But as you increase the focal length, you can also see this in the pictures, this vanishing um, point gets further and further pushed towards the infinite. So at the end, the, part, the, the lines, which in linear perspective should converge to a vanishing point, um, with a large focal length, they 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 tend to not converge, right? Or they converge at the infinite, and therefore, um, like the orthographic camera model is is a good one for large focal lengths. So how does it work? Again, um, so you have an object um, X um, C, and then the, the basically the orthographic projection is just ignoring the Z. So basically the X and Y axis of the camera and image coordinate systems are um, aligned and the lights parallel to the Z coordinate of the frame system. Uh, so, sorry, the light rays are parallel to the Z coordinate of the camera coordinate system. And during projection, the Z coordinate is just simply dropped and the remaining X and Y are scaled by a constant, um, which has to be figured out by, by, by your algorithm typically. So in a matrix, you can write this um, like as follows. You have this S, which is this constant scaling that I was talking about. And basically, the image uh, is obtained by multiplying this um, point in camera coordinates with this matrix here, which is essentially scaling the X and Y components and just dropping the Z components. That's why you have here a zero column for the Z component. So note that S is the unit of S because you're going from world units, which are usually meters, to pixels. Then S should be of units pixels divided by meters um, in order to obtain pixels from 3D points. OK, so that's the end of image formation. This is a relatively quick. Uh, overview of, of image formation if you want to um, like um, get uh, like more information about this topic I recommend that you check uh, like the Mark Leboy uh, lectures on digital photography that's an, an excellent um, course which covers lenses and, um, and and camera properties like aperture and so on um, with 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 much more depth but is a full-blown course on that. Um, and so some of these slides are based on, on the computer vision course at the Penn State University by Robert Collins and um, a couple of slides also from Andreas Geiger here at the University of Tübingen. So thank you. This is uh, as much as I wanted to say about image formation, think about questions, and we will discuss them tomorrow. Thank you very much.